All right. Today, as I already told you, we will begin with combining renormalization group and effective field theory techniques. And uh, in order to begin, I will just wrap up our chapter on the renormalization group with a few comments which I think form the bridge and will give you a little bit of a different additional point of view, which I think is quite useful to have. So these are general considerations on logarithms. <coughs> And you can find similar discussions in the quantum field theory book by Weinberg and in the renormalization book by Collins. And we simply consider a general quantity in quantum field theory. I call it sigma, but it doesn't have to be an observable. It can be any quantity that you want, also an unphysical green function. But uh, let's write it for an uh, observable sigma. And uh, as we already discussed, it can depend on physical quantities which are experimentally accessible, like momenta, pi. But it can also depend on theory parameters like a mass, a coupling, and the renormalization scale mu in dimensional regularization. And let's say our quantity of interest has a unit mass to the power n. Then, in order to analyze which logarithms can appear and how we can study them, uh, we want to make it as dimensionless as possible. And so what we do is we write the dimensionful momenta pi as some dimensionless variables xi times a common energy factor e, such that e is the general um, relevant energy scale of the physical problem in question. And all the actual experimentally accessible variables are written in dimensionless variables xi. And if indeed all um, momenta are of the same order of magnitude, the xi here are all of the order 1. If some momenta are small, then some xi turn to 0 or uh, to some other values. Anyway, so this is how we can write it. So these are dimensionless um, variables. And you can think of them as angles, for example. These would be exactly such variables which are dimensionless, corresponding to ratios between momenta. So if we write it like this, then um, we can pull out dimensionful factors out of the sigma. And uh, for dimensional reasons, the sigma can be simply written as the overall energy scale to the power n, which makes up the dimension. And uh, then we have here, instead of the momenta, we have just momenta divided by the energy, so the variables xi. Instead of the mass, we have the mass divided by the energy. The coupling is already dimensionless, so that remains. And instead of mu, we have mu divided by the energy e. So that must be a strict equality for trivial dimension, uh, dimensional arguments. So now this sigma object and all its arguments are completely dimensionless. And the only dimensionful quantity is the overall energy scale E, which uh, appears in the front. And now, uh, having this in mind, we can study which possible logarithms actually appear. And the point of a logarithm is that it is, involves a singularity if the arguments go to zero or infinity. That is the point of a log. So whenever a logarithm appears, it is equivalent to saying that you have a singularity if a variable goes to zero. So which singularities can there be? So the first one is if some xi go to zero, there may be some singularities. Because after all, why not? Uh, this is so general that there is no way that we would know 
the functional dependence on these variables. So therefore, in general, of course, there can be some singularities. However, we cannot study them at all at this moment because we can study renormalization group techniques which give us information on the mu. So the angles, they are uh, just um, something which we cannot deal with right now. So they cannot be analyzed here, but such logarithms can in principle appear. And uh, if we do not want to study them, uh, we might want to be in a physical situation where uh, the angles or similar quantities neither go to zero nor to infinity, but they remain some constant uh, values of the order one. Then the appearance of these logs is not important. So, but the next one is a logarithm of, let's say, the mass over the energy. And uh, that also cannot really be studied uh, with our techniques, but um, it corresponds to a singularity when the mass goes to zero. And this has a special name. It is a mass singularity, uh, also known as infrared singularity. And the point of these mass singularities is that one can study in general terms when they may arise, and one can exclude the um, appearance of such mass singularities on quite general grounds if you consider particular green functions, uh, which are just known a priori to be infrared finite. So let's uh, write it like this. This can appear only under certain kinematic conditions. For example, um, one condition could be that the momenta pi square are equal to a mass square and the mass square goes to zero. Um, uh, or some other pj square is already zero. That could be the case in quantum electrodynamics if you consider on-shell interactions between a massless photon and on-shell electrons which emit a massless photons, then indeed such infrared singularities arise and they correspond to such logarithms. But now finally, uh, the last logarithm and singularity is the one of involving mu, logarithm of mu divided by the energy and that can, of course, be studied using the renormalization group. Because the renormalization group, as we have analyzed, gives us complete control over all logarithms. And in fact, not, uh, the full dependence on mu is governed by the renormalization group equation. And therefore, in this context, uh, we can have full control over the dependence on the variable mu over e. Therefore, let us now look at a special case, logarithms for the case where the energy goes to infinity. If the energy goes to infinity, then, uh, so the prefactor here is trivial. What we are interested in is the remaining sigma, and therefore we are interested in the dependence, what happens if uh, m over e goes to zero and mu over e goes to zero. And so let us consider the case without infrared singularities. Then uh, there is no logarithm corresponding to the mass and the only logarithm which we are interested in is the one involving mu, which can be studied using the renormalization group equation. So then we can write down the series of equalities. We start with our of a quantity of interest, sigma, with a dimensionless arguments, xi, m, and let us use the m as bar scheme here, m of mu divided by e, g of mu, and mu. And uh, so here we have used m as bar renormalization where uh, the parameters are mu dependent via the renormalization group equation. Is there a problem? Uh, 
Mu divided by E, sorry, yes, thanks. Anything else? Okay. Um, good, so then let us rearrange it. Um, using the renormalization group, we know that we can change the scale mu without changing the physical result. And here in this context, changing mu simply means that uh, this sigma is the same as the following sigma where the xi are unchanged, but mu is changed and the mass and coupling are changed as well. So that is simply literally equal to having here m at the scale e divided by the same e, here g at the scale e, and here mu has become e, therefore this argument is simply now the number one. And then we have basically one um, argument less than before. And here, obviously, there is no singularity. This is just an argument one. But uh, the couplings, uh, G of E and M of E, they have now absorbed the logarithms which previously were there um, as a function of mu over E. Now, we can take the limit where the energy goes to infinity. And uh, in this limit, so the prefactor stays what it is, but in this limit, then we have xi, the mass uh, stays constant, m divided by e goes to zero, so here we have zero, here we have g over e, and here we have one. And this limit exists where this argument goes to zero because of our assumption that there are no mass singularities, otherwise that limit might not exist but by assumption it exists, and then we have this simple behavior, and so you see how you can um, study the high energy dependence of a physical quantity using the renormalization group equation. So this variable effectively uh, doesn't exist anymore, this variable doesn't exist anymore, this has never changed, and here we simply have the running coupling constant. And so that shows that the running coupling constant is all you need in order to absorb all the logarithms. I mean, obviously, that argument one means that there is no logarithm anymore of an argument which would stand here. So we can say it like this. The large logarithm of mu over e in the first line uh, is absorbed. by g of e in the second and third line. All right, very good. So, uh, that is the main point, so a very simple consideration, which however is maybe so general that it uh, can give you some hints on how to study and how to analyze uh, situations that you might encounter in reality. And let me just end with a few remarks. Yes. We assume that there are no infrared singularities, which means that there is no logarithm of the mass. Okay. So that is an assumption, and as you know very well, for many particular quantities that you can select, there are no mass singularities. Uh, that, for example, off-shell green functions where the momenta are away from the mass shell, they have no mass singularities, and for them this limit would literally exist. Um, there are, however, on-shell green functions where some masses are zero, some other momenta are on-shell, uh, then such mass singularities do exist, and so then here the discussion would be more complicated. But that is exactly the power of this very simple-minded analysis, because it uh, shows you immediately the range of all possibilities, and the range of all possibilities also includes singularities of the xi, and we clearly see that. But uh, you can also see in this way which assumption do you need to do uh, such that the renormalization group tells you all you need to know. So, and that is exactly a remark. So, uh, indeed, 
for uh, certain kinematics, uh, which are often important actually. There are mass singularities. So for certain kinematics, uh, there are additional logarithms. And so one would need to study them separately, not only by using the renormalization group, but by additional techniques. But uh, the overall log of E for E going to infinity is um, governed by the renormalization group. So now comes exactly the point. Uh, sometimes there are additional logarithms we also want to study and then we want to combine the renormalization group with effective field theory. And so for example, just to get us started, let us look at the low energy limit. Even still without uh, infrared divergences, if we are not only interested in the high energy limit, but in the low energy limit, what happens in this case uh, for low energies? Of course, our general equations are perfectly valid as well. Uh, but this limit, of course, will now change. But up to here, everything is um, the same, regardless whether the energy is large or small. So this equation is still completely true. And you could uh, study um, small energies and uh, set mu to the small energy scale of the problem. Then you have here the running coupling at small energies, running mass at small energies. And this prefactor here, or this variable, ratio would not become small, but it might become uh, whatever, depending on the context. It might, in the extreme case, go to infinity if you look at energies which are much smaller than the relevant masses of your problem. And so if this variable goes to infinity, then you would need to ask, okay, uh, what happens if a mass goes to infinity? So small energy then would be equivalent to a large mass limit of your theory. And um, in that case, maybe there are additional locks as well, which would affect the limit of small energies. So, but clearly in that case, um, we cannot go to this line and therefore the renormalization group will not tell us all we need to know over large uh, logarithms for large masses. So, in the above, m over e goes to infinity. And uh, so therefore, the renormalization group equation describes not all important logs in this case. where uh, the energy is smaller than some masses. And so in order to use the power of the renormalization group, what you want to do is to go to a theory, namely an effective theory, where there are no heavy masses, but where there are only light masses, lighter than the energy scale of your consideration and then you can use the renormalization group. So use RGB in effective field theories where all masses um, bigger than the energy have been integrated out. Then, in such theories, the renormalization group governs all the interesting logarithms, and therefore, the two-step procedure, uh, integrate out heavy particles, then use renormalization group. That combination of techniques tells you basically all you need to know about uh, logarithms and large effects in a quantum field theory. 
And that is why this combination is so useful and that is what we are now going to do. And let me just uh, reiterate the general um, context of the overall lecture in this semester. We are mainly working with effective field theories coming from integrating out heavy particles, but there are even more general effective field theories where you isolate other effects and you integrate out particular modes in the path integral, not only heavy modes, but maybe some modes corresponding to angles or to small um, other variables. And so there could be effective field theories where you might even study the behavior of some xi going to zero and so on. But this would be a slightly more general um, approach. Uh, but for the time being, we stick to this case where EFTs correspond to heavy masses because that is anyway an extremely broad and useful subject. All right, so having said that, we can begin with this study. Uh, the point, as we already stated, um, and which is confirmed by the method of regions, is that the uh, uh, low energy behavior in the EFT is identical to the one in the full theory. So any singularity that appears for small energies will be the same. And, uh, how can we then apply our uh, polymerization group technique where we said that... Okay, the, the EFT doesn't get rid of the mass singularities. It doesn't, um, but once you are in an EFT with um, a small set of masses, then you might be able to explicitly evaluate uh, quantities with mass singularities. Um, and, um, uh, or the energy is then equal to the small masses of your problem and then there is no singularity, E divided by M. You do not take any more the limit E over M going to zero, but uh, the two are equal, and then you can directly calculate. It can happen that at some point you simply need to, need to do a full calculation in an EFT, but then you have covered all the uh, remaining large logarithms from hierarchies of other scales which are not affecting the physics problem of your interest. But um, as a general guideline, the EFT does not get rid of mass singularities. They are the same in the full and the EFT. Let, me look, uh, let us look at some concrete applications where you see exactly um, the power of um, this kind of idea, which is in the back of this, uh, the mind of this discussion. And uh, then you might also see the limitations. But there are a lot of uh, powerful examples where this can be used. So in the first set of examples is effective field theory plus renormalization group equation at the dimension four level. And actually what I want to do in this whole chapter is really uh, nothing but examples. We will go through a set of examples and I have selected the following examples, namely QED with uh, two fermions, electron and muon, E plus E minus and mu plus mu minus. The muon is heavy, the electron is light, and we integrate out the muon as we did in our exercise, and we will study this example in more detail using uh, EFT plus renormalization group. And actually, uh, extremely similar to this example is QCD with heavy quarks. So QCD with uh, six quarks, including the top quark, versus QCD with only five quarks without the top quark is basically the identical situation. However, it is even more important because uh, strong interactions have much larger quantum effects and therefore having control about logarithms is much more important here than there. And uh, therefore, this is actually seriously used all the time in elementary particle physics. 
A third example, which is also extremely similar, um, is the idea of grand unified theories, where um, you have unification of gauge couplings and uh, why the gauge couplings need to unify and how they unify and how the um, low energy couplings that we measure experimentally are related to grand unification is the same logic as in the other two examples. Finally, let me study um, um, phenomenological application that is fairly recent in the literature, namely the prediction of masses of Higgs bosons in supersymmetric theories. Supersymmetry is, uh, I guess, a well-known concept, and uh, I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, the term, at least. You know that it exists and it is uh, frequently discussed, and a hallmark of supersymmetric theories is that they predict the value of the Higgs boson mass, such that that prediction can be compared with the experimental measurement that we now have, but the prediction from supersymmetry existed already before the discovery of the Higgs mass, and so we can compare the prediction and the um, outcome of the measurement. And in all these cases, we integrate out heavy particles. And uh, we can neglect one over the heavy mass effects. which means that in our effective field theory, we only need dimension four operators because the higher dimensional operators are suppressed by powers of the heavy mass. And since we don't need them, uh, we can work at the level of a dimension four Lagrangian, which means that our effective field theory is a renormalizable quantum field theory. So, and then uh, we want to have as precise predictions as possible in all these contexts, and that will necessitate the combination of EFT plus renormalization group. Let us begin with the first case, QED with heavy muons. So that is, of course, um, coming from our exercise. And uh, I will not do the explicit one-loop calculation that we have already done in the exercise, but uh, we'll understand how it relates to our current context. So we have a fundamental theory, which is QED in our exercise is what call, it was called QED2, with two fermions, namely the muon. So it contains um, electron, E plus E minus, and the muon, mu plus mu minus, and it involves a coupling, E2, as we call it in the exercise, which is the gauge coupling of that theory. Now the question that we want to answer is the following, namely, what is the most precise way how to do calculations in this fundamental theory if you are interested in low energy phenomena. In other words, if you are interested in phenomena of interactions between the electron and the photon only at, elect uh, at electron energies. Please note the fine print. We are asking what is the most accurate low energy description if the fundamental theory is known. So um, that is a different question from asking 
uh, what is the most precise low energy description if some low energy experiments have been done and you want to describe those experiments and from the experimental low energy input you want to predict other low energy phenomena. Here we uh, start from the assumed knowledge the fundamental theory at high energies is known and you want to do a top-down prediction for the low energy processes. And you can already see that this is of course kind of the same as what happens in a grand unified theory where you would assume for, for some reason you know that at the grand unification scale there happens some grand unification physics and using this assumption you want to make a prediction for low energy phenomena and then compare that prediction with experiment and in this way check whether your gut assumption is actually correct. So that is the question. And this question therefore involves two different energy scales, namely the energy scale, uh, the low scale at which you want to do um, predictions and the high scale at which the fundamental theory is, is assumed to be known. So you have a separation of two energy scales. So, and now we can use our calculation that we did in the exercise. That was uh, for a process E plus E minus to E plus E minus at low energies. And so the Feynman diagrams of relevance look like this. At tree level, we have two Feynman diagrams with S and T channel. Then at the one loop level, we have Feynman diagrams like this one with a muon loop. We have Feynman diagrams like this one with an electron loop. We have Feynman diagrams like this with a vertex correction or box diagrams and so on. We have a set of one loop Feynman diagrams and we listed them all in the exercise. But in particular, there are precisely two Feynman diagrams with a muon, namely the one where the muon appears like this in the S channel and a similar one where the muon appears in the T channel. All other diagrams do not involve the muon. And in the fundamental theory, the prediction um, depends on the gauge coupling and we introduced a useful notation, namely, um, so, we always factored out the gauge coupling and we set E2 square for the three level diagrams times a quantity A3 where this A3 is actually equal to a S uh, channel plus a T channel. Then at the one loop level we have E2 to the fourth power times A1 loop, which are all the diagrams without the muon, plus E2 to the fourth power times delta A1 loop, which are the diagrams with muon. And these are of course the ones without muon. So what are the variables which enter these functions? Um, in these functions, which depend only, uh, which do not depend on the muon, the only variables which appear are the electron mass and the momenta, P1, 2, 3, 4. And here also uh, the muon mass appears, of course. So then um, next we looked at uh, the muon diagram specifically and uh, let's just look for the moment at this building block. Um, the building block is um, the inner part of such a one loop diagram, namely the photon propagator times the loop times the other photon propagator but without the attached vertices and uh, uh, external lines. 
So if we have here a momentum Q which flows through the diagram, then, and indices mu nu, then we can write this in the following way, minus i g mu rho divided by Q square times minus i g rho sigma Q square times the vacuum polarization pi gamma uh, subscript m for the muon of Q square times minus i g sigma nu divided by Q square. And so the subscript here m stands for muon. So this was the muon part of the photon vacuum polarization. And here there would be plus longitudinal parts which uh, we could neglect. So here I write only g rho sigma times q square. In reality, there are also terms q rho, q sigma with a the momentum. They are longitudinal, but uh, they can be neglected. So let's neglect them. If we combine everything, then you see that uh, the metric tensors simply combine to minus i g mu nu with the overall Lorentz indices mu nu and q square, 1 over q square, q square, 1 over q square gives overall just 1 over q square. So here we just have the normal photon propagator and it is multiplied overall just with minus pi gamma, pi gamma m in this case of q square. So you can say that uh, the diagram with a photon um, with a loop is equal to the original photon propagator times minus pi gamma, where the pi gamma has the argument corresponding to the momentum flowing through it. And uh, therefore, we have immediately a simple formula for all the one loop diagrams involving the muon, the so called delta A1 loop. Namely, this diagram is equal to that one times minus pi gamma m with the argument q square set to s, where s is the Mandelstam variable flowing in this direction. The other diagram where the vacuum polarization is in the t shell is equal to this diagram times minus pi gamma m with the argument t, q square set to t. So there is not an overall factor between three level and one loop, but two different factors with pi gamma, either with argument S or T. But anyway, uh, we can write down exactly what the one loop contribution is. Uh, e to the four times delta A one loop is equal to E square times AS, the S channel three level result times minus pi gamma m for the muon with the argument s plus a t times minus pi gamma m with the argument t. Now the question is um, an intermediate answer to our original, uh, so the question is uh, this one, what is the most accurate way to do computations for low energy phenomena in the full theory? Now we have set up a one loop computation of a low energy process and we can ans ask um, how good is this description, how accurate is it? Uh, what happens if we do a calculation in this way. So that means we analyze logarithms in uh, um, computation in the fundamental theory QED2. So what are the logarithms which appear? And so you see here we have the diagram with a muon. We have the many diagrams with electrons and so on. 
And here in this diagram, we clearly get logarithm of the muon mass divided by the regularization scale mu. We uh, first of all can see it even if we wouldn't do the calculation, it is clear that such a logarithm can arise. The prefactor of this log will be related to the one over epsilon divergence of the loop. We know from experience that this loop has a divergence. Therefore, we know that there will be ln mu. The only other scale is the muon mass. Therefore, we know for sure there will be ln mu over um, the muon mass. Similarly here, there will be ln electron mass divided by mu. And also from such diagrams, which are also divergent, there are also logarithms of the electron mass divided by mu. And there can also be logarithms of the momenta pi divided by mu. So now you see that uh, regardless of how you choose the renormalization scale mu, one of the two kinds of logs is always large. So of course, we assume a large separation of scale. The muon mass is much, much bigger than the electron mass and the momenta. Therefore, either this log is big or that log is big or both. If you choose mu completely crazily, then both logarithms are large. But in the best possible case, you can make one of them small by setting mu either to the heavy scale or to the light scale, but then the respective other log is automatically large. So you cannot avoid the existence of large logarithms in a computation within the fundamental theory. Oh, maybe a bit color. So that means large um, locks in the one loop calculation are unavoidable. In the full theory, And so what that means is if you uh, do a three level calculation, so okay, let's, let's look at the theory uncertainty. A three level calculation, what does a three level calculation neglect? You know, maybe this is a new way of thinking for you. But let us now not uh, do a calculation, but let us ask if we do not do a calculation, which terms are we missing? Therefore, what is the theory uncertainty of our uh, restricted calculation? So if you do not do one loop, but you only do a three level calculation, how bad is your result? If you do only three level, you are neglecting all of this. Therefore, you are neglecting for sure one large logarithm. Therefore, you are neglecting terms of the order one loop times a logarithm of mu divided by me. Okay. This is what you neglect for sure. And this is a large effect. We assume it is large because the scale separation is large. Suppose you do one loop. Suppose you do a one loop calculation and you choose mu to be either large or small, then as we just said in your one loop calculation, there exists nevertheless a large logarithm. Okay, but you do the one loop calculation, so you take it into account, right? So all is good. But uh, not all is good because you neglect, of course, two loop terms. You neglect two loop terms, but how large are the two loop terms? Clearly, without doing any calculation at the two loop level, we know, uh, because we analyze the mu dependence in general, there will be ln mu square terms at the two loop level. The renormalization group equation has told us that there will be up to ln mu square terms. And uh, they will be accompanied, uh, so they will appear in these forms. There will be this log squared, that log squared, or a product of both logs 
All of this will appear in a two-loop calculation. And again, they cannot all be simultaneously small. Since you do not do a two-loop calculation, all these terms are missing. So you miss terms of the order two-loop times log square of the mass ratio. So you are missing log square terms. These are leading logarithmic terms at the two-loop level. So, and since you neglect all two-loop terms, you neglect in particular the leading logs at the two-loop level. So you make a big mistake. You have a large theory uncertainty. So that is the problem of the full theory calculation. And you see that you cannot avoid this unless you do infinitely uh, many loop calculations or, I mean, at least you have to go to very, very high orders maybe in order to uh, cover at least as many uh, large logs as you need in order to achieve your precision goal. And now let us analyze how effective field theory can come to the rescue to increase the precision of your computational approach. So this is the EFT plus renormalization group approach. And so here the basic idea is this. Let's uh, plot it to visualize it. Here is the energy axis, high energy and low energy. And at some high energy, there is the fundamental theory. And here, that is the muon mass scale. Above it, the fundamental theory is defined. Then below the muon mass scale, we integrate out the muon and derive an effective field theory, which is a systematic low energy approximation to the fundamental theory. And this EFT then only contains the electron and photon, but not anymore the muon. Then in the EFT, we do renormalization group running down to the low scale down to the electron mass scale. The renormalization group running, as we discussed, resums all large logarithms, or technically speaking, we simply have control over all large logarithms at all loop orders. And uh, then, once we are here, uh, we can use the effective field theory at the low scale and do precise calculations, which uh, will not uh, lead to any enhanced logarithms when you do higher orders. And then we have completely uh, control over the large logs. So that is the basic idea. And um, before uh, working this out in detail, let us just ask, um, maybe it is implicitly already said and uh, also clear, but why is it not useful to use the renormalization group in the full theory? There is, of course, a renormalization group invariance in the full theory. There is a beta function in the full theory. Uh, there is renormalization group invariance. And, uh, but why is it not useful to exploit this renormalization group invariance? Because that is what, what I said. So we can choose mu to be large, equal to the muon mass. Then in our calculation, we have here a large logarithm. Um, or we can use renormalization group invariance and uh, equivalently change mu to a small scale. Then we have made use of the renormalization group equation, but then there will again be large logarithms in our calculation. So, and uh, in the context or in the language of our previous uh, more general discussion, there are simply masses in our theory of different sizes. And therefore, uh, not all ratios involving the masses can be simultaneously uh, set to one. So uh, let us work out this in detail. So it is a three-step procedure, three steps. The first step corresponds to the matching. At the high scale, you integrate out heavy particles and construct your low energy EFT. Second step, running. Third step, do the calculation in the effective theory. So let's uh, do this in detail. So first step, matching. 
at the scale mu equal to the muon mass. And that is what we have done in, uh, did we do it in the exercise? Uh, I think yes, didn't, I think we did it. We matched the full theory to the low energy EFT and obtained an equation for the coupling, uh, yes of course we did it. L EFT is the Lagrangian for QED1 without the muon. And the coupling constant is called E1 to distinguish it from the coupling E2. And uh, what we do is we look at some process which involves only low energy particles, so electrons or positrons only. And we set this equal in the fundamental theory. And the effective theory and we have done this calculation, setting the two processes described in the two different theories, set the results equal, and after a small calculation, it turned out that this gives rise to a simple equality between the coupling constants. Do you remember this, or should I put some details? So the equation is an equation between the coupling E1 and the coupling E2. Anybody remembers that? Uh, okay, uh, it seems not so much. Okay, so uh, some detail that I have here is, um, let's say, you set E2 squared times the three level result plus E2 to the four times a one loop plus E2 to the four times this mu one diagram delta a one loop. That should be equal, exclamation mark, so it should be equal to E1 squared times a three plus E1 to the four times A1 loop, but obviously without the muon diagrams, so the delta A1 loop is missing on the right hand side. So the two differences are here you have an additional diagram, but here you have a different value of the coupling constant. And so you require equality and then you can solve for the difference between the couplings in order to make up for the missing diagram. The equality cannot be exact, but it can only be an equality in the approximation that the momenta are much smaller than the muon mass. And uh, so therefore here we have to neglect terms of the order um, pi square divided by the muon mass square. So the and that corresponds to neglecting here in this equation the arguments. If the momenta are much smaller than the muon mass, then both of these arguments can be identified. So the difference between S and T is irrelevant in this limit. You can set S equal T or S and T both to zero or both to the electron mass, whatever you want. Um, but after setting them equal, you can factor out pi gamma at this value out of this equation, and then you can solve for the difference between the coupling constants. And why can you not uh, set equal the processes in full? Because our effective theory does not contain dimension six operators. It is an effective theory where by construction we have neglected operators of dimension six. They would be able to describe such mass suppressed terms. But since we neglected those operators, the effective theory can only approximate the full theory uh, at the order one over muon mass to the zeroth power. Okay, but uh, doing it, uh, we did it in the exercise, gives us E squared times one minus pi gamma from the muon at zero momentum is equal to E one squared. And here, as I said, we have set S and T approximately to zero, but you could also set them to some other value which is um, of the order of the electron mass. All of that uh, doesn't matter uh, since we neglect such terms anyway. But for simplicity, we set it to zero. If we set it to zero, the result is ex accidentally uh, simpler than it would be in general because um, that is then actually just 
itself zero, it vanishes, this contribution. But that is uh, an accident. It doesn't have to vanish in general, and it wouldn't vanish at the two-loop level. But um, so this is really proportional to ln mu divided by the muon mass, which becomes zero if mu is equal to the muon mass. <coughs> So, and um, in some other cases where you integrate out particles, this would just be some uh, result of some loop calculation, which is normally not zero. So, at the, um, let us forget that it is zero um, in general. This is just a one loop calculation which can involve this logarithm. And this logarithm is small because we said mu equal to the muon mass or um, at least mu equal to the order of the muon mass and therefore even if we do not set it exactly equal, this logarithm is not a large number, it is a small number of the order uh, one. Not, uh, it doesn't involve any enhancement. That is the important point. Now what would happen if we would do this matching calculation at the two loop level? What would happen at the two-loop level? Uh, and of course, I'm thinking of logarithms. Which logarithms could appear if we would do it at the two-loop level? At the two-loop level, the exactly same logic would apply. We would get a similar relationship. Um, and let's just say we would need here the two loop vacuum polarization from the muon with the muon in the loop. And then, of course, at the two loop calculation, we know that we can get ln mu square terms. But again, since there is only the muon in the loop uh, apart from the photon, uh, the only logs can be uh, these ones, mu divided by the muon mass. And so if we set mu equal to the muon mass, then all these logs, even log square and single log, they are small. Or they can be put exactly to zero. So therefore, at the two-loop level, uh, there are no large logs. ln m mu divided by m e. So this would be the large logarithm that we worry about. And this, as a matter of principle, cannot appear. It doesn't appear at the one-loop level. We see it explicitly. And at the two-loop level, it also cannot appear. And at any higher order, even at infinitely many loops, such a logarithm by construction will never appear. Uh, in the matching calculation between the two theories, if the matching scale is set equal to the muon mass. And therefore, our theory uncertainty uh, is small. If we do a one-loop calculation, our theory uncertainty is of two-loop order, but without a logarithmic enhancement. So the theory uncertainty is now dramatically reduced. Yes, so uh, we ha are separating the theory. And uh, so at this calculation, there are only loops involving the muons. And therefore, if we set the renormalization scale to the muon scale, then no large logs appear. And now, of course, we uh, need to go to the second step and then the third step of our sequence of calculations and see what happens there. And of course, at each step, we pick up some theory uncertainty and we need to control all of them. But at the first step, uh, this is the statement. So the theory uncertainty here, uh, tree level, neglects. What does tree level neglect? One loop without logarithm. So we see it, this is what you would neglect if you do a three-level calculation, and this is a non-logarithmically enhanced one-loop term. Actually zero, but that is not the point. It is a non-log enhanced one-loop term. One loop neglects two-loop 
again without logarithm. Very good. Just as a small remark, uh, I will not write down anything about that, but uh, you might wonder at a very high loop order level, three loop, four loop, there are of course Feynman diagrams where simultaneously the muon and the electron appear. And so then you might wonder, okay, in these Feynman diagrams, I have mu, me, and mu, three scales at the same time. So for these diagrams, it seems unlikely that I can avoid any large logarithm. But you can, and the uh, reason is uh, the method of regions or the large mass expansion algorithm, which is the algorithm that you need to use in order to do the matching. Only the, in the method of region language, the hard part of the loop diagrams contributes to the matching, because that, uh, we have seen it, how the effective theory, field theory was constructed. Only the hard part of the loops gives rise to the matching coefficients, whereas the soft part of the loops corresponds to loop Feynman diagrams in the EFT. And so the matching comes from the hard part, and in the hard part, by construction, all the light scales, electron mass, and so on are set to zero, so they do not exist anymore as energy scales in the diagram, and therefore, at any loop order in the matching calculation, only the muon mass and mu appear, and therefore, you can set all these logs to zero by choosing the matching scale in this way. So this statement is really true at all orders, and uh, the justification uh, might be a little bit more complicated in uh, general uh, than the simple example might suggest, but it is nevertheless correct. So let us, however, go on. That was the first step. Now we come to the second step. The second step is in the EFT. We use the renormalization group equation. And uh, so then we start with our coupling constant E1. And uh, we have so far obtained the value of E1 at a renormalization scale mu is equal to the muon mass scale. Now we use RGE using the beta function, which is appropriate for the theory QED1. And uh, then we obtain the coupling E1 at the energy scale mu is equal to the electron mass scale. Remember the small subtlety here, the beta function is the one of QED1 of our EFT. Previously, we have said it is kind of useless to apply a renormalization group in the full theory, but now it becomes useful to apply a renormalization group in the effective theory. Uh, why is one useful, why is the other useless? The difference lies in the different beta functions. Now we use the beta function of the EFT, which um, has a particular value, and this value is the correct one to um, describe the, the appearance of all the large logarithms, whereas the beta function of the full theory uh, is just not the one which governs the appearance of the large logs. That is the point. So the change in the beta function is the reason why now the application of the renormalization group is useful. So the beta function of the EFT is the beta function of QED with just one fermion, which has the value E cubed divided by 12 pi square. And uh, so we simply integrate uh, the renormalization group equation DE1 of mu by D ln mu is equal to beta QED1. And uh, if we integrate, we get a solution. We know how it works. It is easy. Um, so the easiest is if you integrate 1 over e square, 1 over alpha. Then you have a linear running. Very simple. And uh, we have calculated also the result. Uh, but what is most important for us now is what logarithms are covered by this. It covers all terms um, of 
the orders n loop times ln to the n of mu. So using um, the one loop uh, beta function, So not only uh, one loop is covered, but also at any loop order, the leading logarithm is completely determined in this way. Uh, maybe it's better to write here the mass ratio muon mass divided by the electron mass. Uh, because if you integrate between these two scales, then these logarithms implicitly appear in the integral of the beta function. and. Uh, so you can express, um, so what it, uh, it means in equations is maybe the following. E1 at the low scale is a power series of the following form, E1, let's write it like this, at the high scale plus some coefficient times E1 cube at the high scale plus some coefficient to the fifth at the high scale and so on, E1 to the seventh at the high scale plus and so on. And you know that in this power series expansion at each order, there can be as many locks as there are uh, loop orders. And uh, even though we only use the one loop beta function, we have all the terms correct of the n loop order times the leading lock. This is the automatic result um, of these, uh, this calculation. All leading locks correct. And for beta 2 loop, also subleading locks correct, and so on. Okay. So this is the result of the analysis that we did. Therefore, what is the theory uncertainty? If we do beta one loop, then uh, we have all the leading locks correct. So what is missing? It neglects the following. For example, at the one loop level, uh, it neglects nothing. At the two loop level, it would neglect um, single lock, lock to the power one of mu divided by me. If you use beta two loop, then it neglects at the two loop nothing, but at the three loop um, log to the power one of mu divided by me. So at the two loop level, it neglects nothing. But let me just make sure this uh, calculation, of course, only leads to logarithmic terms. Um, so at the two loop level, uh, in general calculations, there would be two loop times non-logarithmic pieces. They are just not contained here. Uh, so in some sense, they are also neglected in this approach. So, but the leading or a subleading locks are covered. So you can compare it with the theory uncertainty of our first step. If we do three level only in the first step, we neglect non-logarithmic one loop pieces. If we do a one loop beta function, we also have a one loop non-logarithmic correct and two loop lock terms are neglected. If we do one loop here, 
we, we have everything correct and the first mistake is two loop non-logarithmic and that corresponds to two loop beta functions here. Then two loop is completely correct except for the non-logarithmic two loop terms. So we have a, again a small theory uncertainty. Then let us So then, uh, let's go to our third step. Our third step, we are now at a low scale, and at a low scale, uh, we can use the EFT to do a calculation of any low energy process. So again, I remind you of the ultimate question. The ultimate question is how can we most accurately compute low energy physics if the fundamental theory is known? Now we have uh, control and we know the coupling constant in the EFT at a low energy scale. And so let us now do a loop calculation um, in this theory. So we compute process in the EFT at u equal me. So our process, it was called T1, the matrix element, is now given as E square um, times the three level result plus E1 to the fourth power times our one loop diagrams where we only have the diagrams with the electron and photon without the muon. And now the coupling constant here is evaluated at the scale mu equal to the electron mass, and we have made sure that we know this coupling very precisely from the running. And in the loop calculation now, which logarithms appear? In this loop calculation, there are only diagrams with light particles and light scales. Therefore, the only logs are logarithm of Me or the momenta divided by mu, which are all small. There cannot be any large logarithms anymore. And so therefore, let us again look at the theory uncertainty. Let's start again with three level. If we do only three level, then we neglect, of course, all of this. But uh, what do we neglect? We neglect one loop. Uh, but without a large logarithm. We neglect one loop times no logarithm. Let me write it in the same way, one loop, comma, no log, like here. If we do a one loop calculation, what do we neglect? At the one loop level, we take all of this into account, but we are missing all two loop uh, diagrams. And the two loop diagrams, they would of course again contain logarithms of mu. Uh, they would contain up to ln mu square terms, but the ln mu will always be accompanied with uh, the electron mass or the light momenta because there are no other scales. Therefore, all the locks which appear are small locks. In other words, no large locks. So at the, if we do only one loop, we neglect two loop, no lock enhanced terms. And so that ends our three step calculation. Matching, um, running, and then calculation in the EFT. And let us summarize the overall steps and uh, the theory uncertainty that we obtain. So if we combine all stages, one, two, and three, then we have never logarithmic uh, enhanced corrections. 
at all stages, the logarithms are under full control. And it just depends on the loop order uh, how far we want to go. But the logarithms can be fully under control. So uh, if we do three-level matching plus beta one loop plus three-level computation, what are then the missing terms overall? So three level in step one neglects one loop terms without logarithms here. Beta function at the one loop neglects um, two loop terms with one logarithm. And then, but at one loop it neglects nothing. Then step three at three level neglects again one loop terms without logarithms. So we neglect one loop without logs plus two loop log to the power one of the ratio mu one divided by electron mass. Okay. What happens if we go one order higher? One loop matching plus two loop beta function plus one loop computation in the ERT. What do we neglect now? Um, in the first step, if we do one loop, we neglect two loop terms without any log enhancement. From the beta function, we have a two loop, uh, we have everything, and uh, we have two loop everything means two loop leading log and two loop sub leading log. Uh, but we neglect three loop times leading, uh, sorry, times log to the first power. And at the third step, where is the third step here? we neglect again two loop non-logarithmic terms. So in summary, we neglect two loop non-logarithmic plus three loop logarithm to the first power of the large mass ratio. And so on, okay? Now you can see that in general, what happens if you do L loop matching plus L plus one loop running plus L loop computation in the EFT? Then it means L loop is complete and L plus N loop um, the first um, L locks are correct. and you neglect L plus one um, sub leading locks. So the, the first thing that you neglect is at the next loop order, the non-logarithmic terms, and at the next to next loop order, you neglect single locks and so on. So in this way, we can use all of our understanding of the logarithms um, coming from the renormalization group and uh, combining it with EFT, we also get fixed order information and uh, think of these examples here uh, to understand um, what we can take into account.
this is also a useful reminder of the structure of calculations in quantum field theory. So uh, there is this general rule which has here emerged, which is very well known in the literature and very often discussed. You need fixed order calculations at uh, some loop order and running at the next loop order in order to have a consistent um, coverage of all the logarithms uh, combined with fixed order calculations at some desired order in perturbation theory. And uh, so, for example, uh, in what sense is this now better than the fundamental theory calculation where we had this large theory uncertainty from the logs? So comparing a fixed order one loop calculation in the full theory can now be compared either to this or to that approach in the EFT. So if we compare a fixed order one, one loop in the full theory to this, what is the effort that you need to do in the EFT approach? Here you work only at three level. Here you work only at three level, extremely simple. Here you need the one loop beta functions. Uh, beta functions are always coming from the literature or if you want to compute them yourself, <laughs> then it's easy because one loop beta function contains only divergences. You only need one loop divergences to get a beta function but in order to do otherwise, the one loop calculation in the fundamental theory, you need the finite parts, which are much more difficult to compute. So that is extremely simple compared to the one loop calculation in the full theory. And that is of course extremely simple as well. But the uncertainty that you have here um, contains um, of course non-logarithmic one loop terms, but at the two loop level, you have the leading log included in your calculation but in the full theory calculation, the leading log at the two-loop level is not included in your calculation. So it can be that this extremely simple EFT calculation is more accurate than the full one-loop calculation in the full theory, namely, if the large leading log is numerically sizable. If the large two-loop log is larger than the non-logarithmic one-loop term, then this approach is simpler and better than the full calculation in the full theory. And when is this large log more important? Uh, for example, if you have such a hierarchy of scales like muon mass divided by electron mass, or even more dramatic gut scale divided by electroweak scale, then such a calculation is way more precise than a full one loop calculation in a grand unified theory. Yep. Yes. So for QED, I imagine what is uh, actually with this coupling squared is smaller than the log. So yes. So for QED, it would be a borderline case. And, uh, but for grand unification and also for QCD, um, where uh, the logarithms are even more important, um, this is also uh, more important than in QED. Um, here, this calculation, that is now not technically simpler than the full one loop calculation in the full theory, but it's way more accurate. Here you have everything that you would have in a full one loop calculation in the full theory, namely you have the full one loop result. At one loop, nothing is missing. Uh, but in addition, you have the two loop leading locks and the, the two loop sub leading locks. So only non-logarithmic two loop terms are missing, which are really small and at the three loop level, um, single locks are missing. And the effort is only a little bit higher than in the full theory. You need two times an explicit one loop calculation. However, for simpler diagrams, because the muon doesn't appear anymore, or you can use method of regents to do the calculation, and you need a two loop beta function, which um, must be calculated once in order to be able to use it here. So, but this is the sequence of steps that you can do in order to dramatically improve the precision of your calculations if you have a fundamental theory which involves such a hierarchy of scales. And so this is basically the paradigm example 
uh, which can be applied to all the other cases that I already mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Let me just uh, draw a box. So this is an important statement. As I said, this is very well known in the literature and used all the time to characterize what you should do in order to have a precise prediction in such a situation. Yes. So for the description of the accuracy, we never take um, into account the terms that we neglect in the EFT, the one over n squared term. Yes, 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 exactly. So I forgot to say that. Indeed, so that is, of course, also an advantage of the fundamental theory calculation that the mass suppressed terms are not neglected, but here the mass suppressed terms are neglected. That is absolutely right. And so it depends on the situation whether uh, the mass suppressed terms are more important or less important than the resummation of the logarithms. And uh, exactly. By the way, I have it here on my sheet, so let me also write this down. Oh, we do not have much time, but we have enough time to write this down. So just this small comparison in the fundamental theory and in the EFT plus renormalization group approach. So here one loop is exact, two loop um, ln square terms are missing. And here, one loop is not exact, as you have just mentioned, up to mass suppressed terms of electron mass square divided by muon mass square. So they are neglected already at the one loop level and missing sub leading blocks, depending on which order in the beta function we use. Um, different sub or sub sub leading terms are missing. But here, uh, indeed, that is important to remember that we always also neglect mass suppressed terms. And so then, clearly, uh, that is not a calculational device that you should always apply to every calculation, but it depends on the situation. So you have now a toolbox, and you can select what you need, fundamental theory or EFT, using different orders of the different steps. And also, by the way, of course, you can also tweak these calculations. Uh, you do not always have to combine it in this way, L loop, L plus one loop. You can also do L loop, L loop, L loop. Um, and then you uh, cover different combinations of loop orders and logarithms, depending on uh, what is the need of your situation. All right, so that is the paradigmatic example. And let us continue with the other examples in the next. Lecture. Yes. Short detail question. Um, this L plus N loop, does the N refer to home to the difference in loop levels of the beta function? So you mean that I calculate um, No, we have no um, let's let's uh, work out an example. So if L is one, we have uh, two loop beta functions and then at the um, three loop level, so or a two loop level at the two loop level. Um, the first two locks are correct. So at the two loop level, only non-logarithmic terms are missing. At the three loop level, so L plus uh, two, at the three loop level, wait a minute, uh, at the, if we have L plus one loop running, then the first L plus one locks are actually correct. So that means uh, if L is one, then we use two loop beta functions and at the two loop level, the first two locks are correct. At the three loop level also, the first two locks are correct and the single lock is incorrect and so on. L plus N, the first L plus one loop locks are correct. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks.